Philosophy Battle, the most entertaining presentation of philosophy you'll ever find on the internet, probably. Now entering the battlefield of philosophy of science, Philosoc. Now on Philosophy Battle, our ferryman will answer the second of these three questions. But first, I did make a short supplement video before this, and while I did have the foresight that doing a quick jolt of epistemology might confuse my audience, I failed to clarify a few things, which I'll do now, but if you don't care because you didn't watch it, or you know what I'm about to say sounds like mumbly bumbly stuff, then just click to here. Now in that video I explained the terms epistemological relativism and constructivism because Cole doesn't and I'm fine with my crash explanation of relativism and constructivism but there are a few things I left out because I used JTB for the explanation of epistemological part which I totally knew was bound to get me into trouble. First to be clear I did not and as of now would not truly endorse the enterprise of JTB. Actually I believe it cannot be fully successful. That it is doomed from the get go for reasons that will eventually become super apparent. But that doesn't mean I don't believe it can have successes, smaller successes, and still be useful to teach how we can flesh out our ideas about knowledge, hence why I used it. Secondly, while I was very, very clear and enthusiastic that we do not want to remove the capital T from JTB or JTB+, I think I failed to clarify that this corresponds to the sentiment that we must always keep a component that is in some way connecting what we call knowledge to the way things are, the objective world, reality, or the term used most in the following piece, nature. I promise to explain why this is so exactly when we get to metaphysics, but the failure really was that I didn't clarify the connection of T to JTB as being attacked by the SSK only represents a translation of the SSK's attack of nature's connection to scientific knowledge. Though I think many viewers could have realized this by putting two and two together, but still I didn't actually clarify that connection so that's why I'm saying it now. Thirdly, it is only a translation, when in reality they are not, nor is Stephen Cole ever actually using JTB or talking of JTB in what I have to present here. While I'm unsure about Cole, I have good reason to believe that the SSK share the same reasons I have in feeling the enterprise of doing JTB Plus is doomed, so it's not fair for me to describe them as taking JTB positions without noting that I know they wouldn't really be doing JTB in the first place. Still, I believe I was generally accurate in my account and what Cole is saying of them if they were forced into taking JTB positions, or if one was inclined to present them through JTB, which I was, to help explain the varieties of epistemological relativism and that the SSK are taking a variation we are against. Whew. So that should be good enough to defend myself from potential attacks for my supplementation video. Also, I'd like to note that this video is officially episode 5, since the previous was just a supplement for this video. Let's just get into Stephen Cole now. Until 1970s, sociologists of science took the content of science as being determined by nature, not social factors. But then in the late but then in the late 70s, early 80s, Europeans adopted a relativist epistemological view that challenged this at first calling themselves relativist constructivists, then later social constructivists. In a single decade, these social constructivists with their relativist epistemological position went from few to completely dominate the sociology of science and the social studies of science. Now some deny that dominance because they don't like to be seen as the power elite or the establishment. So I'm going to intrude here and I might do this again, but it's interesting that Stephen Cole is making a comment about the organs of our enemy. Now I did say in an earlier episode that I called them enemies because they are enemies to science advocates, and while I do consider myself a science advocate, truth is I consider them enemies or my opposition because of their epistemological and metaphysical disposition. It is certainly not because of their authority challenging sentiments but more to do with their weapon and the way in which they're wielding this philosophic weapon seemingly with a lack of understanding. In fact, I actually very much agree that it pays to question the authorities, the establishment, 
we must call out the tribalistic prejudices, bias, or naivety of those who claim themselves to be authorities. In fact, it is definitely in line with the organs of the philosophers to challenge the presumption of knowledge in our path for true philosophic knowledge. As say Socrates went around challenging the rich and the royal to show that not even they have knowledge. Or say John Locke pointing out how just because everyone agrees or the majority agrees on a belief doesn't mean it's knowledge. Now Stephen Cole gives an example of the Handbook of Science and Technology Studies as a clear case example of that dominance, saying that it's virtually all constructivists or political allies of constructivists. He says it's important to note that social constructivism is not just a point of view, but a group that tries to monopolize rewards for its members or fellow travelers and exclude from recognition those who question any of its dogmas. Now if this is so, the irony here is tragically thick that they are in fact behaving as tribalistically. Now he brings up the editors of the handbook and how they refuse to put a chapter of the topic of social stratification in science, claiming that no one was willing to make that contribution, which is hard to believe given how much about stratification was being published in other areas of sociology. But then when Cole actually offered to make that contribution, they didn't even bother to get back to him. Now he says the top two pieces of writing that established the social constructivists were Bruno Latour and Steve Wolger's Laboratory Life and Karen Norsetina's Manufacturing Knowledge. And their epistemological position was highly relativistic. Scientific facts were not constrained by nature, but were socially constructed or made up in the laboratory by scientists. I think it's quite clear with that statement, even for those without philosophic training, to perceive why that is a threat to scientific authority, scientific claims to knowledge, and all the real world cases of our society relying on scientific knowledge to make judgments about what we should believe. DNA results, toxicity of certain chemicals in our food, the potential of solar flares getting too close to Earth and knocking out our electrical grid, for example. Now Cole brings up a direct quote from what he calls another leading constructivist, Harry M. Collins, which is a contestable quote, but you'll see him address that. For now, just feel and try to understand the damaging impact to science with the sentiment being expressed. Collins stated that the natural world has a small or non-existent role in the construction of scientific knowledge. The fuzz sociologists say what? Now before I blast in the battle because if somebody says something like that I'm ready to go to war, let's just get back to Cole. Now Cole says that Collins and some of the other constructivists backpedaled on this, saying that they didn't really mean it and that it was just being used as a polemic statement or that it describes methodological relativism, not really epistemological relativism. Which yeah, if it's methodological relativism, not epistemological relativism, that's cool. Which as I explained earlier, perhaps Cole means to imply that they are saying having different means to know is not as radical as actually having different knowledges itself. But Cole says Collins and other sociologists clearly did mean it as epistemological relativism, saying that it is the core belief of the entire program. Some sociologists say scientific facts are socially negotiated in the lab, others that social economic interests determine the content of scientific ideas. An example he gives is David Bloor, who argued that Boyle's law was influenced by his political beliefs and to protect his Irish land holdings. He does note in 1930 similar arguments were made about Newton, but he goes to ask where these views came from. Sure, we can see similar movements in other disciplines around the same time, but there's little evidence to think that other fields is what directly influenced them. Get ready for the coon. The single most important influence on the development of social constructivism was clearly the classic book by Thomas S. Kuhn, The Structure of Scientific Revolution. Check out episode 4. Kuhn's book seemed to give warrant to the view that social consensus determined nature rather than nature determining scientific consensus. 
Now, for those of you that come from an analytic philosophic tradition who will notice that Cole isn't being really careful with his terms, but hey, that's okay. Uh, once again, let's not pick at the appendages, let's try to find his organs if you really want to attack or protect. <laughs> uh, again, I make mistakes all the time. I'm pretty sure there is a flurry of mistakes even in the quotes I make, direct quotes. Sometimes I actually misread a word, but you want to attack me, attack my organs. Uh, so let's just continue. Now Cole notes that it's actually political reasons why constructivists became so popular, in that many politically left came into sociology in the 1960s and thought that the dominating view, which was functionalism of Robert K. Merton at the time, was conservative. So that promoted the idea of picking up any weapon they had to attack them. Now this sounds tribalistic. As the constructivist gained steam in the 80s, pushback started, with some earliest to attack the constructivists being philosophers of science themselves. Hence why I call it sociologists versus philosophers, or vice versa. Larry Lauden, Ronald Dyer, David Hall. Now this piece actually comes from uh, the flight from Science and Reason, which is a compilation of many contributions to challenge the constructivists and defend science. So there are a lot of other philosophers that can do the job of challenging the constructivists on a philosophical battle, which I would prefer to do. But anyway, he says he'll just let the other contributors present the philosophic issues and philosophic confrontation with the constructivists rather than himself. Now he points out that it wasn't just the philosophers but eventually also historians that came out against the sociologists, pointing out the lack of accuracy in their portrayal of how science was actually developed. Now again, this is very ironic that they themselves might be misrepresenting historical accounts of science just to support their position, according to actual historians. So I suppose one can say they were manufacturing evidence to support their thesis. Do you get that the irony is so thick? It's so thick up here, <coughs> it's getting hard to breathe, but that's only the beginning. He says among the critics were Stefan Brush, Martin Rudrick, Peter Gallison, but not just them, even Kuhn himself. That's right, these guys gain access to the philosophic battlefield to make sociological attacks with the extreme relativistic weapons that they have using Kuhn, but Kuhn himself has to battle against this enemy and their anti-reality slash nature sentiments when it comes to science. He quotes Kuhn. The strong program, another term for the relativist constructivist approach, has been widely understood as claiming that power and interests are all there are. Nature itself, whatever it may be, has seemed to have no part in the development of beliefs about it. Talk of evidence or the rationality of claims drawn from it and of the truth or probability of those claims has been seen as simply the rhetoric behind which the victorious party cloaks its power. What passes for scientific knowledge becomes then simply the belief of the winners. I am among those who have found the claims of the strong program absurd, an example of deconstruction gone mad. Now Cole also notes that many constructivists like to cite scholars like Rudwick Gallison in their work without even recognizing that these scholars very much stand against them. Now the reason why they do end up doing this is because those scholars also reject what Cole calls a stereotyped view of positivism. Now I don't really know why he calls them stereotyped, he doesn't really get into that but it does tell me that he might have sort of sympathy for non-stereotype positivism but he doesn't really get into it. It's just that he says constructivists seem to have set up a sort of straw man and it's in that way against this straw man, against the stereotype positivism, that they can make others appear to be as if within their own camp against that enemy. But practically everyone does that nowadays, even me. Heck, even Kuhn. But though Gallison and Geyer reject the same stereotype positivism that Kuhn does, they also reject the relativism that is at the heart of the constructivist program. Hmm, heart, eh? Sounds like organs, huh? This part again shows us the tribalistic nature of these sociologists. 
tribalistic in that they're using the us versus them mentality to make allies with others that are not necessarily actually in agreement with them. So they can end up counting or citing scholars as if they support their constructivist program, when really all they support is attacks on the old and outdated positivism. Now Cole doesn't really say at this point in time, but he does suggest there is reason to think that this isn't merely a tribalistic trick a malicious strategy by the SSK, but rather a result of actual philosophic ignorance. Which honestly, I can understand that difficulty. I think not just for people in sociology or history, but uh, fresher philosophers might have difficulty seeing the important role of reality, if it is the case, and it is, that we can't point to reality or make direct observation. And we'll talk about this in the future on the metaphysical battlefield, but for those of you who are philosophers, and I'm sure you'll agree, that it's understandable that when we move from correspondence theory of truth to meaning as use, let's say, just something, an alternative theory, there could be conceptual difficulties in understanding that reality still plays an important role. It can be scary at first. How can we be involving reality if we aren't referring to it? Did we lose reality when we made that move? And oh, what happens to the T in JTB? Did we just lose knowledge too? And so, from the misunderstanding that results when we move away from positivism or correspondence theory, we get unsure relativists and skeptics, which can be created out of that movement. And I say here unsure because they may not even know exactly what kind of relativists they are. Back to Cole, he says within the greater sociology field, other sociologists weren't really opposing them. He says that there was a criticism by Thomas Guyron, a former Merton student, which Cole admits was flawed, but that once Guyron noticed the power of the SSK takeover, he converted to them and is now touted proudly as one of their members in the way that converts were displayed in the Cold War. Now look, this is getting really spooky, if you can't tell Cole is progressively through this piece displaying these enemies as acting tribalistically to the point of comparing them to using powerful, almost politically cult-like practices of the Cold War. He says, in fact, there wasn't any real or significant attack by other sociologists on constructivists till my book got published in 1992. Four reasons why other sociologists were so late to come into the battle to also fight against these constructivists is because firstly, like I said, many sociologists were happy to see anyone take on the Mertonians for political reasons. Second, they were also happy to see anyone attack natural science since natural science always held themselves as higher than social science, so they were happy for them to be taken down a peg. So the whole field of sociology kind of had a dog in this fight too, a little tribalistic themselves one might say, not just of sociologists being anti-Mertonian, so initially at least giving the SSK a pass for political reasons, but also sociology as a field being somewhat revengeful against natural science, giving them a pass again there. Cole saying of the leader of the constructivists that Bruno Latour readily admits the delegitimization of natural sciences was one of their goals. Citing a debate between Latour and Callan had with Collins, the field of science studies has been engaged in a moral struggle to strip science of its extravagant claim to authority. Any move that waffles on this issue appears unethical since it could also help scientists and engineers to reclaim this special authority which science studies has had so much trouble undermining. Now keep in mind in this quote science studies he's talking about sociology studying science not talking about science itself. So it's social studies about science which has engaged in a moral struggle to strip science of its claim to authority. Moral, revenge, politics, Delegitimization, strip authority, these words are strikingly clear as they go beyond reasoning and truth. As they themselves say in that piece, we wish to attack scientists' hegemony on the definition of nature, 
we never wish to accept the essential source of their power, which is the power of the philosophic association between what is natural and what is sociological. Now the third reason why other sociologists took so long to get to the battlefield and fight their brethren, you could say the constructivists, is that most American sociologists didn't really have the philosophic understanding of the European constructivists. So they wouldn't really understand their work or were afraid to engage in battle that would necessarily involve philosophic argument, an area where they felt distinctly disadvantaged. He says it's probably more than 50% that didn't really even understand what was being said when they were citing Latour. People were just jumping on without having any understanding. Fourthly, he says there also wasn't much pushback because Merton himself never wanted to take a leadership role, so the Mertonians didn't really have a leader to unify against these constructivists. And also that at first Americans just thought it was a European thing and they could just ignore it. Also Cole kind of describes uh, American sociologists as being more interested in using science to study sociological issues and Europeans more interested in using sociology to study science. SSK source I think. He says let me surmise, if sociologists want to show that social variables influence the cognitive content of science, they have to say exactly what about the cognitive content is being influenced. There are three ways it could be influenced. The first way it could be influenced is called the foci of attention, which is what do scientists actually study? What do they focus on? And there's no problem to admit that this can happen or that sociological reasons can significantly influence this. Even Merton himself showed that war and economy influenced the decision of what problem scientists were to solve. So there definitely were sociological influences. The second way could be the rate of advancement. And it's easy to imagine war being pressing here, but also the loss of funding. Lots of reasons could be included. Social organization of science itself could be a reason. Now Merton also studied this and is also addressed by others. So there's no problem in the rate of advancement also being influenced by sociological reasons. The third way is the substance of solution. For example, in Bruno Latour and C. Volger's Laboratory Life, they argue that scientists socially constructed the discovery of TRF, thyrotropin releasing factor. So the scientific community came to believe that TRF's chemical structure was this, pro nh 2 I don't know what that means at all. If you're a chemist, you could explain it to me in the bottom comment, but I probably won't care. I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm just gonna call this pyro whatever for now, but uh, don't take any offense to that. I'm just a lay chemist, you could say. Anyway, they thought that the scientific community came to believe that that's what TRF was rather than something else. And it's this last one the substance of solution that we are actually concerned with. The other ones are okay, but this one we're not. You see, for them, science is not constrained by nature. So that means TRF could have been something different, and neuroendocrinology would have progressed to the same degree, or perhaps an even greater degree, had some other structure been identified. And remember, they aren't saying that an alternative would do better because it's somehow closer to truth, just that an alternative could have been constructed, since everything is construction for them. I argued in my book that in the entire constructivist literature, there isn't a single example that supports this claim. They haven't once shown how specific social variable influences a specific cognitive content. There's always some crucial aspect missing. They can show how social processes influence the doing of science, but fail to show how that affects the actual knowledge, outcome, or what eventually makes it into the core common accepted scientific knowledge. Now to show that that was the case, one has to look closely at their texts. First, I'll give you an example of how they show that social processes do influence how they do their work, but not the outcome of the work. In Laboratory Life, probably the most cited work of constructivists, they describe social negotiation between two scientists, Wilson and Flower. And yeah, they succeed in showing that just like anyone else, they engage in social negotiation about their work. 
but failed to show how that negotiation actually influenced any aspect of science. This is just one example, but a lot of their work talks about how scientists, like any ordinary human being, engages in social negotiation, but doesn't actually go on to show how that influences anything that becomes commonly held as science in any way. Nor Satina does the same thing with discussions of two scientists, Watkins and Dijek's social negotiation, but never say it influenced the actual scientific outcome. In fact, in her famous analysis where scientists negotiated 15 different versions of a paper, she doesn't even say that it really made any difference in the end anyway. Was the last draft really that different from the first? If it was that different, did that paper even have any impact on the scientific community? And Cole says, it was a trivial piece of science she was analyzing anyway. Other times, constructivists look at scientific conflicts, but never show how the resolution of scientific conflicts was influenced by the social variables. Again, I think he may just not have been careful with his words since social variables influencing is certainly different from creating the resolution to scientific conflict or being the resolver. But I think it's safe to assume that he means influencing the content rather than how and what, as he has clarified earlier. Cole says it's actually pretty sad that their most cited work is Andrew Pickering's Constructing Quarks, where Pickering discusses a debate physicists have over two theories, one being color theory, another being called charm theory, let's say. So charm won, but Pickering doesn't show that it won because of social factors. In fact, his analysis actually leads to the opposite conclusion, that it was experiments that settled this so-called conflict. A student of mine pointed out to me that there may never have been a legitimate conflict to begin with. Now if there was a legitimate conflict, we would have seen a citation to both the theories before the resolution, and then a drop in citation to the loser of the two after that. But there were almost no citation to color theory other than the two proponents. Talk about manufacturing, seems like this conflict was manufactured. Anyway, as I said, Pickering himself shows, whether it's a legit conflict or not, that it was solved or resolved by the empirical evidence. Cole goes on to say that constructivists actually frequently show that they know their theoretical approach can't match what they empirically observe. Now, I don't doubt his sincere conviction, but if he's going to use the word frequent, I would have loved to see multiple re references and citations for that statement, but I guess it's fair since he tells me to go read his book, so maybe I should do that. But he does give an example from Laboratory Life. In Lab Life, Latour and Wolger told us about a scientist who delayed publishing his research about TRF being pyro whatever because he trusted the authority of another more established researcher who had different convictions about TRF. So basically, social authority delayed the TRF discovery. But that doesn't at all say that TRF would have been something actually other than pyro whatever, just that its discovery may have been delayed a few years. Basically, they sneakily changed the dependent variable from cognitive content to rate of advance. So whenever you go out and read these constructivists yourself, ask yourself this. Did they actually identify a real social independent variable? And did it influence the actual cognitive content rather than just the foci or the rate? And by influence, we mean that it turned out one way rather than another. So sure, Latour and Wolver can show us how sociology affects the rate, but fail to show us a single example of cognitive content. Cole then points out to what he calls a frequently used trick by the constructivists, uh, that you can't separate the technical aspects of science from the social, and so all of it is socially constructive. Therefore, the content is created by the social contract. But he says that's what the debate is about in the very first place, is how much the technical aspects of science is influenced by the social. So if we're just going to assume that it's all social in the first place, then that debate is really out of hand. He says if there's only one solution to a scientific problem, like TRF, before our discovery of it being pyro whatever, then there's no room for social factors to influence its content. He says, if the constructivist position is correct, this means that it would have been possible that some other structure of TRF could have been accepted as fact, 
and that discipline in both its pure and applied aspects would have proceeded with just as great success. Which sounds ridiculous. He says that even they show their skepticism about that, and cites part of laboratory life where the research was possibly going to be stopped, and admitted that all this meant was that there would be a delay in a few years, a few years wasted for discovering what TRF actually would have been, not that it would have been different. They also fail to explain why some local productions, which is what some researchers like Nor Satina actually call laboratory science, why some of those productions become successful in large scientific communities and others not. Latour's discussion of social strategies and power can't really explain cases like DNA being accepted into the core of science almost overnight. The authors were unknown so didn't have any social power and connection, and their opponents were leaders with much greater social power and authority, Cole's in effect falsifying them. <laughs> Uh, just to note, just because you were not down with the Popperian falsification as a criterion for demarcation doesn't mean you can't use that term while we're doing philosophy or history or sociology. Certainly Popper didn't invent the fact that one can point to counterexamples to show that one's ideas are not universal. Anyway, back to Cole. My book is full of examples of constructivists failing to do what they claim. And looking at what happened to that book, just shows how good they are in taking criticism even. All the reviews by constructivists were just so harsh. One even made two negative reviews in two different journals. Now I suppose for our internet generation that's like a hater downvoting your video from two different accounts, which is a little extra even if it's a bad video. But we also do have reason to believe it isn't a matter of his book just being actually bad, since he says that all the reviews in, in the greater sociological field in mainstream American sociological journals were good to great. But the most notable reaction by constructivists is how much they ignored it. Where they have to write a review, they write a bad one. And where they don't have to write a review, they just won't do it. He says that's why his book, which is full of constructivist failures to do what they claim, has gone unreviewed from the top two leading specialty journals, the Social Studies of Science and the Science, Technology, and Human Values. He counts that as a reason why probably more than half of the members of the Society for the Social Studies of Science don't even know his book, which is full of those counters, even exists. Besides blatant distortions of what I said in the book, or using the review just to do some Mertonian bashing, most use that old, we never said that, or that's not what we meant technique. Listen, most constructivist leaders are not stupid, not even in the slightest. They know what they're saying doesn't actually hold, and if pushed to its foundation, is logically absurd. Now I'd like Cole to explain that description, specifically why it's logically absurd, because I wonder if he means what I'll show in the next episode. But anyway, he says, therefore, all they can do is say they didn't say that, or that I didn't mean it. So for me, one response is to sit down with my book and their text read them both closely and point out whether they did or didn't say what I said. For example, one review says I rely on misreadings, and this is what she says. He insists that the constructivist research program is premised on denial that the realities of nature play any part in scientists' deliberation, whereas his antagonists merely presume that the realities cannot be abstracted from the theories and technologies that frame them. Statements like that make me wonder how the reviewer ever got out of the 8th grade. Whoa, little extra mean there. I mean, I get that you've been slighted multiple times by this tribalistic group taking over your field of study, but <laughs> that's a little extra, don't you think? Can't she read that direct quote I gave from Collins? Or is it because he didn't really mean it? So long as constructivists don't really mean their relativism, then there's no issue with my view anyway. Stephen Chapin is another one, sugarcoating the constructivist pill. He says that Latour shows that there's more social politics happening inside the workplace than outside for scientists, and that going out and gaining support from other scientists is a social aspect. Yeah, that's fine, those Mertonians wouldn't disagree. 
but in that review he fails to deal with the relativism as the core of the constructivist program. Now look at him, he's doing work on stuff those Mertonians were doing 20 years ago. He's been doing work to show the influence of the authority of the gentleman in 17th century science, but there's nothing about the social influencing the content. The idea that, oh, science is somehow beyond authority and trust that has to do with direct observation is something he challenges. Now check out this quote. According to the classical view of history and the philosophy of science, consensus is determined by empirical phenomena themselves. Theories supported by empirical observation would become part of the consensus. Theories at odds with observable facts would be discarded. Once we have accepted the notion that consensus does not automatically spring from nature, we are forced to pay more attention to sociological process through which consensus is developed, maintained, and eventually shifted. One of the primary mechanisms through which consensus is maintained is the practice of vesting authority in elites. There is one problem with that quote though. That quote is from my book with Jonathan Cole in 1973, and that book's not even cited by Shapin at all. And I'm not saying that I came first so my book is more important. Shapin is doing great work in his own right, but it's that without relativism, there's virtually no difference in the kind of work he's doing now versus the so-called misguided Mertonians. It's like two groups being virtually the same but one group just hating on another group because they think of them as their political adversaries and having a component inside of them that when their so-called political adversaries ask them about that radical aspect or variable in their group, they deny that it exists and when they do, it turns out they're exactly the same. It's kind of like tribalism for no reason. So what are the constructivists up to now? They're all over the place. But they're also stronger than ever in, in political control of organizations, journals, and science studies programs in universities. After the fun of harping on those Mertonians began to die down, they started to splinter off into warring factions against each other. One problem constructivists always had, which did help switch some constructivists out of relativism, is the problem of reflexivity. Precisely, yes. Now we're getting to some philosophical stuff. If natural science is generated by social power structures, etc., and not constrained by reality, then so is the sociology of science. Why would anyone read Latour or any other if it's just a social power grab and not in matter of what actual reality really is? Now this is a very good philosophical point. This reflexivity point is huge and will become familiar, I promise you that, in the future. Now if they take this seriously so, and some actually do, they end up actually analyzing their own work. But when Latour and his French sidekick, Callan, realized this, they turned on a dime, claiming they were never relativists. Now they are working on something called actor-actant theory, and interestingly, things come back into the equation. In a famous paper of Callan's about the science of scallop fishing, he concludes that the experiment failed because the scallops wouldn't cooperate. Note that he is saying that it does matter how the scallops actually are. So now in a vicious back and forth between Latour and Callan on one side and Harry Yearly and Stephen Collins on the other, Collins correctly accuses Latour of leaving the relativist constructivist program. They say, the crucial final quotation in Callan's article on scallops is to establish that larvae anchor, the complicity of the scallops is needed as much as that of the fishermen. Once again bringing back the fact that it's not just the fishermen who matters here. And Latour and Callan actually don't even bother responding to that. Instead they just make successful attacks on Collins' work which show how it privileges sociological work while doing its best to strip the privilege away from science. Latour and Callan say, for example, that scallops do not interfere at all in the debate among scientists striving to make scallops interfere in their debates is not only counterintuitive but empirically stifling. It is indeed this absurd position that has made the whole field of SSK, social study of scientific knowledge, another term for constructivism, look ridiculous and lend itself to the mere social interpretation. And remember, that's coming from Latour, the previous leader. Cole then says an intelligent reader ends up having to agree with both sides, 
and I don't really know what he means by saying that we have to agree with both sides. But then he goes on to say that their work, if taken seriously, is nothing other than absurd or voodoo sociology. Sociology of science has gotten into a philosophic mess, and as many constructivists have seen, it leads nowhere. Latour's latest book doesn't go much beyond actor acting stuff he developed with Callan. In both, he argues that the modernists try to locate things where they are on the spectrum of nature versus society, on that polarity, but that made it impossible to deal with hybrids, or things that move back and forth as they develop. So that TRF thing would have been made impossible because it's not just one thing. Scientists develop it socially and then it becomes nature once defined. So he's adding the time factor. But he doesn't go on to answer why some things stabilize and other things keep moving on the spectrum. Nor does he explain why some things stabilize at the nature end and why things stabilize at the social end. And maybe because of all of the obscurity in his latest book, his followers call it his best contribution yet. It's a wonderfully convenient time to point out how cult followers love obscurity in their leaders so that they can fill those gaps with claims to a magical insight beyond criticism and in a rightful way accuse their leaders enemies of not fully understanding but it's only right because no one does, no one understands, there's nothing to grapple. No one understands the thing of which could not be understood because there's nothing there to understand in the first place. Anyway. Then he goes on to say that he doesn't know why his book gets criticizing for asking the type of questions that he does, and he lists them, which to me sounds perfectly sociological, uh, about how social factors affect scientific communities such as the relation of a nation's progress to its number of scientists, how age affects whether elderly scientists get funding or if younger ones are thought of as more creative. He asks, aren't these the questions that the sociology of science should be asking? And doesn't it represent the kind of work that has been literally wiped out by the dominance of the new social constructivists? In my book, Making Science, I'm calling for more harmony between the constructivists and the traditional sociology of science. Because constructivist work still is very good in pointing out that science isn't what's depicted in the beginning of the philosophy of science. Yeah, this is what I refer to as what we learned in high school, but also what Cole referred to earlier as the stereotyped positivism. Direct observation, empirical evidence, supporting theory, etc, etc. But again, that he called it stereotyped positivism just makes me think that he must have some sympathy for what he considers non-stereotyped positivism, but he doesn't really explain that, so I don't really know. Then he describes some of what he's doing in his book. Things in the core scientists take as true, things in the frontier scientists still have lots and lots of debate about. And in fact he says the consensus is so little on the frontier that it makes it very difficult to get funding. He says that actually it's so difficult that that 50% of your chances of getting funding is straight up luck. So clearly the social in fact does play a role, but so does evidence from the natural world. The sociology of science should investigate how social factors and evidence affect each other in the evaluation of new knowledge, and if the constructivists can just let go of denying any role to evidence with some level of objective constraint by how reality actually is, then we can still make use of their work in investigating the interaction. Cole says he likes to think of himself as a realist constructivist. Science is socially constructed, but to what degree is constrained by nature? Now I don't really know if that title is necessary, but anyway, finally he says, and I'm gonna read his final paragraph in this part uh, completely, My work in the sociology of science has led me to strongly reject the conclusion that natural sciences are entirely socially constructed, but my life in the social sciences has made me more amenable to the possibility that these social sciences may indeed be entirely socially constructed. Ideology, power, and network ties seem to determine what social scientists believe. Evidence is frequently entirely ignored. I have recently begun to address this problem in an article entitled Why Sociology Doesn't Make Progress Like Natural Sciences. That social science is completely or almost completely socially constructed 
helps explain how a social constructivist view of science could have become so powerful in the absence of any good supporting evidence and in the face of such devastating empirical critiques as those found in the books like Peter Gallison's How Experiments End. Wow, with that final statement, you can really feel how tragically ironic this war is. The SSK accused science of being dogmatic and holding dominance over the field of knowledge, and yet they're the ones who dominate in their field. They punish or ignore dissenters, seemingly unnecessary or unjustified punishment as well, proudly displaying converts in the SSK. They accuse scientists of manufacturing facts in the lab, when it is in fact they who are the ones who manufacture narratives by denying accurate historical accounts by real historians and possibly creating controversies to support their arguments and in fact claiming conclusions unsupported by their own analysis. So what's so voodoo about them? For me it's that they are what they hate without any self-reflection. They are what they accuse others of motivated by political reasons, not philosophic understanding. It is a cult-like anti-science movement of the political left. I don't know why as yet, but they perceive all their opposition as right-wing. Now, political tribalism is very powerful on the right and the left. The tribalistic right's anti-science sentiments see science as a secular vehicle of the left. They perceive science as attacking their religious beliefs, spiritual faith, and conservative traditional values, which may include their belief in divine natural gender roles, rituals, man's loving dominance over women, animals, and the environment. They have anthropocentric values, which is everything revolves around humans, or possibly even so-called religious facts like geocentrism, that the earth is the physical center of the universe, or creation stories, the age of the earth, and non-evolutionary beliefs. The tribalistic left's anti-science sentiments see science as an extension of the pompous elite upper class's arrogant dominance over what counts as knowledge, and therefore whose beliefs has value. They see it as merely another outdated social-political power structure of western imperialism, misogyny, and supremacy associated with the conservative right. Coupled with their desire to treat different classes, cultures, identities, belief systems as equal as if that's required to treat others with equal dignity and respect leads them to attack science. Currently, many use the political spectacles of right versus left to identify or help to identify the organs of an ally or enemy. The tribalistic mentality of us versus them tends to turn everything into a two-party system, placing issues on a one-dimensional spectrum, when in truth issues may be more complicated than that. Now perhaps having only two political parties may contribute to the tribalism and the complexity of the human character becomes more hidden. While I believe calling oneself right or left is relative in that many who call themselves right would in a different more extreme right society call themselves left and many of the left in a different more extreme left society might call themselves right, I do not actually do the philosophy of politics academically to a credible degree. So in truth, I'm not even able to even predict how an argument would be made for an absolute political center. And this show is not encouraging you to identify your political tribe, though as stated admittedly it may help us to find our enemy's organs.
why I bring this up is how interesting it is that even in a country like the United States, where there is a two-party system, we're trying to identify political tribes as usually the first tribalistic location we try to assess, where currently bipartisanship is incredibly scarce, I find it interesting that in situations where conversation is forcing the tribal spectacles of pro-science versus anti-science instead, that people of the left and the right can come together in attacking science. I'm not sure if those on the right are aware of it, but I am sure that some with anti-science sentiments on the left are not aware that attacking science for the purposes of your organs being towards equality and tolerance and challenging authority like the SSK also provides the same weaponry to attack secular society's ability to demarcate against religious theocrats, denying global warming, pushing homophobia and misogyny with their belief systems, or say, I don't know, trying to teach my Buddhist children Christian religious beliefs while in science class. That's a callback to episode 1. Watch it, and then watch the whole series over again to now and see how this whole story connects. By the way, I don't actually have Buddhist children and I'm not Buddhist. If you were thinking that's my organs, it's just a theoretical example. Now, having philosophic understanding and understanding of philosophy allows me to appreciate and demarcate all that falls within the limits of science. But then there are limits. And I'll leave that discussion to later, but I bring it up to point out how having understanding of some philosophy and philosophic understanding often has me against the anti-science tribe, but can in some cases in fact put me against those who are in the pro-science tribe. Because even when it comes to pro-science versus anti-science, it is not really the science that motivates my taking the side. Particularly in this case, as I explained earlier, it's much more about the weapon the enemy is using. The anti-realistic relativistic weapon that they wield, which I will address as my enemy. And I challenge this weaponry whether it's used against science or anything else for that matter. For now, as I promised, we've reached the portal. It'll take us to the battlefield of metaphysics. I need you to trust me and trust yourself because it may get really wacky in there. When going deep into philosophic issues such as metaphysics, we can get lost. But I need you to remember how this connects to the real world, how it connects to the things we believe and do, and how we run our society. It's much easier to do philosophy and realize how science connects to everything we do and say because there's so much of science in our society right now. But try to remember how this metaphysical stuff will connect through epistemology to science when we're there, okay? Remember what Immanuel Kant says. Metaphysics is a dark ocean, with that shores or a lighthouse, strewn with many a philosophic wreck. Now remember what I say. There is always a way out. There's never an end. Because philosophers keep battling.